Hey crew, before we get started today, I wanted to remind you that we have a Facebook group called Enterprising Interlocutions, where we talk about all things Trek, and specifically the kind of themes that come up in Trek episodes, and also the themes that are discussed on Enterprising Individuals. So check it out, search for Enterprising Interlocutions, or you can find it by going to facebook.com forward slash EISD pod. I also wanted to let you know that our T public store is on sale this week. All of our t shirts are 30% off, and this includes our Janeway shirt, our Gauron shirt, all of our branded show merch. It's anything you want our images on cell phone cases, coffee mugs, everything's 30% off, and we're adding new designs all the time. So check out tpublic.com forward slash user forward slash just enough trope, all one word. That's our parent network to get 30% off snazzy Trek gear. David R. George III joins me once again on this episode, and I had a great, very productive, very interesting talk with him. And normally, I take the outtakes from my talks with guests, things that are a little off topic, things that go on a little long or get kind of goofy, and we put them in our live gah feature on our Patreon. There will be a Patreon feature for my talk with David George. We talked for a long time, but Dave is such a knowledgeable and focused talker that it's really all on topic. And we're not only covering the last episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, but we end up talking really about the entire series as a whole. And much of our talk strays even back to the beginning to Encounter at Farpoint. So a lot of it's in here. Uh, this is a longer episode. Uh, not too long. I hope that's okay. If you want extra little bits from the conversation, though, you can go to patreon.com forward slash E-I-S-T-P-O-D, and you can get those extra bits there. And that's it. Enjoy the show. With that, let's get underway. It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can't hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your mind. Hailing Frequencies Open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and if you learn nothing else from Star Trek, remember, don't put your hand in primordial soup. I'm joined on this episode once again by New York Times and USA Today bestselling author David R. George III. David is the author of many Star Trek novels, including stories set in the original series era, Deep Space Nine, and the Lost Era Adventures of the Enterprise B under Captain John Harriman. His latest novel, Original Sin, features Captain Sisko in command of the USS Robinson on a mission to explore the Gamma Quadrant. Dave, welcome back to the show. Happy to be here, Aaron. It's great to have you here. Today we'll be talking about All Good Things, the last episode of the seventh season of Star Trek The Next Generation and the series finale. Star Trek The Next Generation was a bold experiment, an attempt to revive a television franchise that had been off the airwaves for 18 years, but it wasn't a franchise that had lain fallow. The success of the original series film franchise inspired Paramount to try and do some more Star Trek, but it would be a complicated and risky proposal. None of the original actors would return in a regular capacity. Instead, the series would feature a cast of unknowns led by a bald Englishman. Setting the new series nearly 80 years after the original meant an entirely new visual aesthetic had to be developed. New writers would have to develop a unique voice for the new show and would have to struggle against old ideas and sometimes each other to find that voice. Oh, and one more thing. The show doesn't have a network. But now, with over 30 years of hindsight, the success of Star Trek The Next Generation seems almost inevitable. It survived its rough early years, survived actor and staff changes, survived unfavorable comparisons to its inspiration, survived even the death of its creator. And yet the next generation of Trek cemented not only the future of the franchise, but became the standard by which all future science fiction series would be judged. But we'll talk about that a little later in the show. Uh, in addition to being a very successful author, you're also a film buff, and you write movie reviews on your website. What did you think about 2018 as a year for movies? Were there any standout films for you? You know, it's funny. I was just looking at the Academy Award nominations, yeah. that, which came out this week, and, and as I was looking at them, I was struck by 
the thought that, wow, this was a kind of a weak year for movies, at yeah. least the kind of movies that I particularly enjoy. Um, I'm not a big spectacle kind of uh, <laughs> movie. And, like, you know, I mean, I, there uh, certainly there are spectacular movies that I love. I mean, sp- spectacle in the in the in the you know, special effects and epic stories and that kind of thing. Since I like smaller, quieter movies, um, and uh, I just didn't see a lot of good dramatic films out there. Not to say that there were none, but it just didn't seem like there were a lot of them. In the, in the big eight categories, the, the, the best picture, the, the four acting awards, the directing award, the two writing awards, those, those big eight awards, mm-hmm. there are usually usually 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 even films represented in total. And this year, there are only 15 films in those big eight categories, which I'm not sure if that if that suggests a, a, a weak year for films. I mean, it could suggest, you know, 15 fabulous films, but I, I didn't really see that from looking at the list. There were movies that I enjoyed, but that I didn't think were particularly you know, best picture material. I really enjoyed Bohemian Rhapsody. I love the music of Queen, Freddie Mercury. And I thought it was a pretty good film. Best picture, not for me. Well, we're talking about All Good Things today. And as a movie aficionado, I'm curious, have you seen the film All Good Things from 2010? I I don't think I have. I'll tell you what it's about. Uh, It's about the son of a New York... Uh, city real estate tycoon whose wife goes missing and the suspicion is on him. And if that sounds familiar, it's a fictionalized <laughs> account of what we know about the Robert Durst case or what they knew at that time. And it was written right. directed by one of the guys who would go on to produce the HBO documentary series, The Jinx, which uh-huh. is about Robert Durst. And it stars uh-huh. Ryan Gosling in an early role. Wow. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with it. I mean, I did not only have I seen it, I don't think I've even heard of it till just now. So. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Yeah, it's a smaller film. Uh, I believe it was a Weinstein Company film. And I just think it's interesting that I haven't seen it either. So I was just sort of, uh, you know, trying to find out if you had. But it, it, it's funny how we create fiction uh, based on real events. And then we learn things later and realize, oh, maybe that wasn't the real story at all. Right, right. Yeah, just sure. going off the Robert Durst thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I I, uh, I watch a lot of movies. It's amazing that there are still so many out there that I oh, haven't there's, seen. Yeah, there's no way you can see them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, and no way you'd want to see them all. You know, I'm not a huge <laughs> Star Wars fan. I mean, I liked the original Star Wars sure. back when it was just Star Wars, uh, uh, you know, before there were, you know, when three trilogies and the standalones and all of that. But mm-hmm. Solo intrigued me because mm-hmm. you mentioned it earlier. Um, sure. Because, first of all, I, thought, I think Alden Ehrenreich and, and uh, Donald Glover are both amazing talents. Yeah. And just from the trailers that I thought, saw, I thought, wow, these, these two guys are doing really, not exactly impressions, but they're giving a great impression of the characters they're playing. I thought they were just genius casting choices. Mm-hmm. So I went into Solo kind of excited, not, and, and I haven't seen any of I don't watch, I haven't seen, I saw the original three Star Wars movies at some right. point, but right. I haven't seen any of the subsequent, the prequel trilogy or the latest two of the three that are out. Um, so, um, but I did, I thought Solo just intrigued me. And yeah, it's just, just, I thought they were great. The actors were great, but the rest of it was just like, eh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed rather pedestrian. Which yeah. was disappointing to me. Yeah. And if – well, for me, um, as far as like these spinoff movies go, if they're trying to capture a different sort of emotion than the sort of epic saga of the regular movies, I thought that it was probably the most successful in that. In that it was – you know, it was a lark. It was a heist film. Right. And it felt kind of fun and it wasn't too um, heavy, mm-hmm. which is what I didn't really like about um, Rogue One. I know that they were trying to go for like this sort of war movie kind of thing, but it was just so relentlessly kind of depressing and dark and so, so, yeah, Solo was, I mean, it was, it was fun. And my life is not any different <laughs> since I've seen it. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, <laughs> but, I, I agree with you on that. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, didn't, didn't make any changes in my life. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm not a bad movie, just not a particularly good one either. So, yeah. Why did you choose this specific episode, All Good Things, to discuss today? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, you and I have talked twice before about Star Trek episodes on your 
fantastic podcast that I really enjoy. Um, we talked about uh, the corporal might maneuver, which I think is an over uh, an underappreciated, underappreciated, often overlooked episode of the original series. And then we talked about duet for at the end of the first season of Deep Space Nine. And so the first thing I thought when you and I were maybe kicking around the idea of talking again about an episode was, okay, it's time for Next Generation. And so uh, I reviewed some of the the uh, episodes that you'd already done, which I would have loved to have done, but you've already done, um, <laughs> so like Inner Light and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I saw that you hadn't done All Good Things, and All Good Things is one of my favorite, uh, I, I was going to say hour, but hour and a half of television. Um, my favorite episode, one of my favorite episodes of Next Generation, but also one of my favorite episodes of just about anything, because while finales of television series have now become a thing it didn't used to be that way shows would just get canceled and they would end and that would be it but now it's you know they try and put meaning and substance into those last episodes and 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 uh, and, and round things out that in a way that's really satisfying to viewers um a lot of them still don't succeed and i thought the next generation's final episode all good things was just Firing on all on all cylinders, as a Star Trek episode, as um, a, a good story on television, and as a capstone for the entire series. Uh, and I thought, in particular, Patrick Stewart just did a phenomenal job. Yeah, that's a great point too. Because as a finale, they aren't trying to, oh, they're going to shut the ship down, or, or Riker's moving on, or something. You know, we of course the movies are coming out, but we get the the implication that they're just going to go on and they're just going to continue on their mission and they're going to keep doing all those things. We're just not going to be following them week to week anymore. And it has a hopefulness to it. Yeah. Very ending, which um, is just great. I think, Um, yes, they're going on and things sort of aren't changing except really in a personal sort of emotional way. They are changing because there's a growth to Picard in that final episode, Mm -hmm. uh, which is particularly interesting. We've seen him grow from the beginning of the series and throughout the series, but even in this last episode, there's yet more for him, more personal growth for him to experience, which I think is just fantastic. Um, Yeah, and it's not even, it's not a promotion, it's not a career thing, it's not some great discovery. He just goes and plays poker with his friends, and he's never done that before. Exactly. I, I mean, he's always had this uh, aloofness to him. And in fact, I, I think that was a Roddenberry conceit. And, and it's not mm-hmm. a new conceit that, that the commanders of ships and people um, need they can't fraternize. To, yeah, they can't. They, they, ha- they have to remain apart. And, and there's a, a loneliness to command. And we, we see that with Kirk in The Naked Time and other episodes. And mm-hmm. um, I think Roddenberry tried to carry that uh, that part of a, a captaincy to Picard, and we, we saw that throughout the show, but we also saw him grow and certainly, you know, acknowledge his feelings for Beverly and things like that. Um, but yeah, that there was just something about that very last scene that just put such a, a, a great capper on the, on the show. It just uh, was very impressive, I thought. And, and all the more so for not being a promotion, for not being a change of circumstance, for not being some big thing. Um, in in a, a spectacle sort of way, but being a small thing, but an important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Important for the character and for the series and the franchise as a whole. Well, we're talking about the TNG episode, All Good Things, dot, 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 the feature-length series finale of Star Trek The Next Generation. It first aired on May 23rd of 1994. The story and teleplay were written by Ronald D. Moore and Brandon Braga. Uh, they're both writers, producers, and show creators. Uh, but we mentioned many times on the show before, Braga was the co-creator of Star Trek Enterprise. Moore co-created the Battlestar Galactica reboot, as well as the drama Outlander. Between them, they've written, written many episodes of post-TOS Trek, as well as writing the film Star Trek Generations and Star Trek First Contact together. And the pair won a Hugo Award for their work on this episode. Uh, the episode was directed by... The Vinrick Colby, who shares that Hugo Award with Moore and Braga. Colby directed 48 total episodes of post-TOS Trek. The start date for this episode 
as it begins, is pointedly 47988.0, but it will uh, range over 3.5 billion years of time throughout <laughs> the episode, focusing mainly on three time periods, 2364, 2370, and 2395 in the Gregorian calendar. And I think this episode also features what was probably the largest jump in time depicted in the franchise from the show's present to the primordial Earth, 3.5 billion years in its past. That was superseded, however, by the Voyager episode Death Wish, in which a renegade Q takes Voyager to a moment seconds after the Big Bang. And your assignment, David, if you can, uh, is to give us a 25-word synopsis of all good things. Wow, I forgot that there was homework. Yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> only 25 right. words worth. Well, I mean, that would have been homework. Now it's just a pop quiz. Right. <laughs> Picard, suffering from a mental disorder, also believes that he's traveling in time, moving between three separate time periods just before and at the uh, beginning of his captaincy of the Enterprise, mm -hmm. during the quote-unquote current time frame, which at the time was the seventh season of the show, mm -hmm. uh, and 25 years in the future, after he has been away from the Enterprise, he's been an ambassador, and now is just apparently retired and working uh, at his vineyard. Right. And they discovered that there is way more than 25 words, but... <laughs> they discover that there's a, a, a subspace anomaly that is common to at least two of the three time frames, and they think that that may actually have to do with Picard's moving in time. And, of course, then there is the, the appearance of Q. Right. Now I want to do a backup episode where I take like one of my first shows and sort of cut it in. And then I uh, speculate, do some show where I'm an old man, uh, an enterprising <laughs> individual still doing this somehow with Eremotic Syndrome. This is, of course, the last episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, and even though it wasn't a final goodbye, as, of course, the cast and crew were going directly into production on Star Trek Generations, uh, it was at times emotional on set. Michael Dorn recalled in an interview for the Blu-ray edition of All Good Things that he was holding back tears in between takes of the final scene of the episode, and it was also a sometimes contentious farewell, uh, as the cast and crew were working long days to complete this episode, and they were also being filmed for the documentary Journey's End, uh, which was charting the progress in, in the wrap-up of the series. And apparently Patrick Stewart, who was heavily involved in the production of this episode, as well as having directed the previous episode, was exhausted and irritable, and he ended up yelling at an Entertainment Tonight camera crew. Uh, good for him, I say. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Yell at those uh, those vultures, but that's okay. Uh, Braga and Moore were writing the script for All Good Things at the same time that they were completing the film script for Generations, and both stories include time travel and a strange spatial anomaly which I found interesting. Um, an early version of this episode featured a fourth timeline that would take place at the Battle of Wolf, uh, Wolf 359 and show Picard as Locutus and also see the return of Hugh, the Borg. And I'm glad they dropped that. I mean, inasmuch as this is a look back at Picard's career aboard the Enterprise, and it's a nostalgic one, I wouldn't want him to be that defined by that horrible thing that happened to him. Plus, they go into that in first contact anyway, I guess. I have to agree with that, and I think that the three time frames that they chose, obviously the current time frame makes a lot of sense, but mm -hmm. the just before and during his first mission aboard Enterprise, also really well observed. For one thing, it allows you to bring back Tasha, yeah. um, and having Tasha Yar there is uh, a big deal. Uh, it's interesting because I was noticing Worf during those scenes was way more talkative than he was during <laughs> Encounter at Farpoint or any time at that first season because he was actually... Um, sort of a background player at that point, right, you know. Right. Um, and they have that little bit where he's uh, he's calling a security alert, and he's like, "Okay, Worf, take care of this." And Yar's like, "Wait a minute, uh, yeah. excuse me." <laughs> yeah, which yeah, I thought that was fantastic. And then twenty five years in the future, that allows you to show that they've drifted apart. There, there, there's some bad feelings between Worf and Riker. In fact, Troy apparently is dead. Um, and of course, they also work the episode, the time travel, well enough that they make clear that just because this did happen in the future, we've now changed what happened in the present and in the past. Right. So it's going to necessarily change what happens in the future. So we've shown you this glimpse ahead, but hey, guess what? That's, you know, we got movies coming out, so we're not locked into that. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There was a line cut from a scene in the earliest timeline that would have established um, that oft heard about but rarely seen Dr. Salar had been serving as the acting medical officer uh, prior to Dr. Crush's arrival. Mm. 
Uh, Trek writer and producer Michael, Michael Piller is the one who influenced Braga and Moore to develop the second half of the episode and actually include the element of the three timelines working in concert with each other, which, in my opinion, is the best part of the episode, um, especially with the way that they uh, handle the editing and the sort of uh, connecting cuts in between the three timelines. It's just that that's, that's a great uh, element to the episode. Really a fantastic element. I mean, editing, the editing of that episode was was spectacularly good it, it yeah. just um every transition for picard is just handled with just incredible deftness i i loved it and, and commented on to my wife while we watched the episode the other day <laughs> um i it just and then she she concurred um yeah, yeah they do a really good job and the thing about the three timelines too is that for one thing it allows you to see the growth of the characters mm-hmm. um and and sort of reflect on it. And it also certainly gives Patrick Stewart a, a great opportunity, you know, and all of them really, but especially Patrick Stewart, to show uh, just his acting chops, acting, you know, 25 years older, acting as, you know, an old man. Um, it doesn't work all the time, but he did a great job of it. Yeah, and he's yeah, and he's definitely different as well. And maybe some of that frustration was coming out in how much he's sort of yeah. yelling at everybody. He can let that <laughs> yeah, out maybe. a little bit. I loved how the transitions also went from him being completely confused, you know, like he was just waking up uh, from a from a sleep or something, to that last part where the facility uh, the facility that he has in the transitions, you know, where he's talking to somebody and now he's talking to somebody else and just repeating the order or giving the next order to uh, fire the tachyon beam or you know, to, uh, to scan the anomaly is really good yeah they they in fact they gave over some dialogue to that right because he said at first the way he's remembering it or not remembering he just has vague impressions it really does seem like when you're trying to remember a dream in the brain yes. dreams take place in, in a, a part of the brain that is just in the human brain anyway um that is, <laughs> it, that is essentially temporary memory so it's a physiological thing why people can't remember dreams, uh, or even if they remember them upon waking, you know, an hour later, half hour later, they're gone because yeah. it's just the memory just dumps. And and he, he acted like the the way he was talking, but oh, I just can't, I can't remember, I can't, I can't grasp, but I can't. It felt like, oh yeah, this sounds like a dream, John Luke. And and uh, but but then he gave. Uh, some dialogue later, after some some transitions between one time frame and another, he says, "Yeah, I'm 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 as I as I do it more, I'm remembering more. Mm-hmm. I'm able to I'm able to process it more." Yeah. So they even foreshadowed the fact that yes, he was going to be able to go from one timeline to the, another and essentially communicate with himself, basically have those memories um, as though he was living a continuous life, although in three different time frames. Yeah, and we, we'll get into this a little later, but I wonder if that was the purpose of the test in that Q talks about the new frontiers that they will explore. They think that they're just exploring space, but there's so much more to see and them showing the ability to at least in part be able to understand uh, seeing you know time from different angles or being able to hold different timelines in your mind at the same time, if that's, that's really the, the entry test that they're being uh, presented with. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Q has a line in an earlier episode, uh, the um, Q Who, the first appearance of the Borg. Yes. He has a line in there where where he's essentially challenging Picard uh, about humanity's worthiness to be out among the stars. And he's saying that there are treasures, I I don't remember the exact line, but something like there are treasures to sate your soul and horrors to 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 freeze your soul and something like that but sure. it, it, it talked about the the sort of extremes of experience out in the universe and as a writer that made me think you know i don't know they they the, the borg war is sort of an example of that of, of the, these these horrors that you couldn't imagine and then all of a sudden you know what for me one of the things, great things about the introduction of the borg in that episode was that the borg didn't have a lot of dialogue mm-hmm. and they didn't really tell you what they were doing but just by their actions you knew that this was trouble i mean bad 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 trouble right. um they were just they were they were they were the big monster and uh, and they did a great job of that and i just thought that line from q made me as a, a viewer want to see sort of more of that and that, but it's a really hard thing to do it's hard to reach beyond human experience 
yeah. as a human to to craft a story that's going to drag people past human experience. It's 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 tough. It's it's very hard. Um, I think you know the introduction of Q in this episode, the inclusion of Q in this episode, um, in all good things, was inspired because he was such a great foil for Picard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and people loved him. And I like the fact that he's both villain and sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge ally. Right. I mean, because, in fact, according to Q, the Q continuum sort of posed this three timeline test of humanity. Mm -hmm. And Q, it was his idea to give him a little helping hand. (laughs) Right. (laughs) An extremely small. I also like the fact that at this point, uh, Picard traveling through, you know, these three timelines and also just in his experience with Q, I, I kind of got the feeling that even before he yells, all right, Q, get out here. He kind of knew this has got to be a Q thing. And then especially, <laughs> yeah. especially yeah. when he goes back to the time of Farpoint and they go out to, uh, uh, to the anomaly or whatever, he's like, okay, come on, Q, where are you? Get out here. Right. Well, yeah. And he's expecting the, that barrier. He's expecting the, the experience from encounter at Farpoint and it, it doesn't transpire. So what does that mean? What is happening? And clearly it's, it, you know, Q's got to be involved if Q's not here and he should be here. Yeah. And it's, it's a really tense situation too, because as sci-fi fans, longtime sci-fi fans, we watch this and we know, don't change anything in the past. It's going to really affect the future. <laughs> right. And when they say Farpoint's canceled, it was like, no, what? <laughs> you can't, yeah. you yeah. can't cancel Farpoint. I thought it was very interesting the way they, uh, you know, of course at that point, in the first season of Next Generation, they had tried to do without a chief engineer character, yeah, right? Right, right. I think they identified the chief engineer at one point, and maybe there were two chief engineers. I don't know. I think you saw one at one point. I don't even remember his name. But um, and then the second season, they made Jordy the chief engineer, which you know worked out. But sure. um, at this point, not only did they not have an identified chief engineer, they also Riker wasn't even on the ship. So at one point. Picard talks to Riker, who's on Farpoint, waiting for Enterprise to arrive. And, yeah. uh, you know, they, you see Riker on the screen. It's like, oh, those are scenes from Encounter at Farpoint. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a good touch. Yeah. Uh, right. They made a lot of small changes uh, to the sets to return them to their season one appearance, um, like changing some of the detailing and changing the side panels on the bridge. Uh, although the um, they did not change the chairs who, that were redesigned in season two, uh, the command chairs, they were left the same. And also the presence of the pool table in engineering uh, is there, which was not present in the pilot of the show. Uh, the pr- production of the episode was scheduled for 16 days. It was a double length episode. Uh, one additional day was required, though, to shoot the primordial Earth scenes uh, in studio. And then filming on Generations began the very next day, shooting scenes for the Enterprise B sequence of Generations. The wow. S- yeah, they got right back into it. Uh, the scenes set on Picard's vineyard were filmed at Callaway Vineyard in Temecula, California, and they used an actual vineyard this time uh, instead of just having to try and suggest one, mm. as the production did for the fourth season episode, Family. And it paid off because the episode won an Emmy Award for special visual effects, and it was also nominated for music, editing, and costume design for a series. Uh, as you mentioned before, of course, John DeLancey returns as Q in this episode. This is his eighth appearance on TNG as Q, and he made 12 total appearances in uh, Trek as Q. This is only one of four episodes in the Trek franchise featuring Q that do not have Q in their title. Right. And that would have been hard to work in. Uh, I think yeah. All Good Things is probably the way to go with this. Yeah. Uh, Q was created by Gene Roddenberry, of course, and named uh, after English Star Trek fan Janet Corton, who was the first president of the UK Star Trek fan club, and Roddenberry had spent time in her home in Scotland. And I, the character of Q, I think a lot of people agree with this, um, the character of a playful and omnipotent being is very similar to the character of Trelane sure. from the original series episode, Squire of Gothos. And according to David Gerald, the writing staff for the first season of TNG, they didn't think it was a very good idea to revive that type of character and sort of told him so. But Roddenberry persisted and he said that, no, his plan for this character uh, would be a good one. We're going to do something a little different with it. Well, and that's sort of a Roddenberry trope right that's he reusing his old ideas <laughs> i mean well i mean he well roddenberry like you know we we, we find uh, a, a, an omnipotent being and it turns out to be either a child or a computer right yeah <laughs> right? Uh, you know i mean we've seen that a lot of times and the fact is you could argue that there are only so many stories right there are you know five stories seven stories what a man versus man man versus himself you know whatever right. man versus nature 
it's always in the execution. And I would, I probably would have agreed with David Gerald at the time that that was not a good idea because we've seen this, not only have we seen it before, we've seen it from Gene Roddenberry before. So why yeah. do it again? But John Delancey was so good and it allowed, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know whether John Delancey informed the writing or the writing cr- created Q as played by John Delancey, but it certainly w- once that first episode was established, they really ran with Q and had so much fun with him. And sure. he's interesting as one of these characters who is villainous without exactly being a villain. I mean, he's if not uh, you know omnipotent, if not uh, if not all powerful he certainly is very powerful right. and could easily not only could he have killed them we we've seen um you know in q who if he did nothing they would have died right at the right. end yeah. he's the one who saves the ship yeah right so um so you've got this omnipotent being but it's clear that he's not entirely he may be adversarial but he's he's not he's not the the, the all terrible villain because he's you know he's he could kill them and he doesn't he could yeah. do an all manner of terrible things to them and doesn't you, and, i mean you could argue that he did terrible things but they always <laughs> seem to benefit from those things yeah ultimately i think and this episode is really all about that i think that john delancey's performance had to have informed the character because I mean, there's nothing wrong with william campbell uh, as charlene he does a great job but the way that Delancey can be kind of playful and then turn in a second into something really sinister uh, really adds like a, a depth to this character because even if this care even if Q did become like an ally of sorts to the Enterprise you'd still wonder I don't know if we trust this guy right. totally <laughs> yeah he had he had that undercurrent of malevolence and yeah um I mean, William Campbell was fine as Trelane, and and he played what was on the page and what he was directed to do and, and it wasn't malevolent so much it was a, a, a powerful but petulant child right, right. i mean mm-hmm. that's 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 how the character was construed that's not q right yeah. there's obviously similarities between the two but they really are distinct and uh, and john delancey certainly ran with it yeah and peter david's trek novel q squared uh he actually writes Trelane as being a member of the q continuum right right, and it's right. suggested yeah. that he's the son of uh, john delancey's character mm-hmm. Uh, in this episode, Denise Crosby returns to the show one last time as Tasha Yar. This is actually the first season finale of TNG where she plays Yar, although she would be in the season two finale, Shades of Grey, in a uh, pre-recorded clip, and she would appear in the fourth season finale as the character Selah. Andreas Katsoulis appears for the last time as the Romulan commander Tomalak in this episode. Tomalak appeared four times in TNG and was first seen in the th- season three episode, The Enemy. Uh, Clyde Kukatsu returns again for a third time as Admiral Nakamura in this episode. And Patty Yasutaki re- returns for the 16th time as Alyssa Ogawa. She would also, of course, go on to appear in Generations and Star Trek First Contract. Uh, contact and <laughs> this is an interesting char- first contract is a whole other movie yeah <laughs> uh and uh th- there's an interesting character in this uh, episode uh, played by pamela kosh uh the character of jessel uh data's hard-driven maid right. uh kosh appeared previously on tng as mrs carmichael in times arrow part two she owned the uh the hotel where picard stayed in uh, san francisco uh she's best known probably for playing mrs simpson on saved by the bell and it's <laughs> it's such a strange character it's just this little sort of flourish that uh is fine and it's funny but i wonder if there was a purpose beyond just having her being entertaining to give uh, Data this put put him in this situation where he's kind of the, uh, the 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 lord of the house and then he's got this sort of crusty maid that works for him. It did feel like there was more there that maybe got taken away. I don't know if stuff ended up on the editing room floor. It did feel that way to me as well because she's sort of this I don't know Dickensian character that yeah <laughs> right and and she I don't know if she was intended as a, a foil for Data and and there was you know maybe maybe it got cut at the script uh, in scripting but maybe it got cut at the in the editing room. I, I don't know, but it did seem like. Because she's her her appearances are kind of prominent. Um, mm-hmm. They give they and her dialogue. It's not the kind of dialogue you hear from just a background character very mm-hmm. often. So it felt like there was more to her than than we saw. So I, I'm not I'm I'm not sure what happened there, but it, Some, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, somebody's got to feed all those cats. <laughs> right, of course, it's a million cats. 
Uh, I think there's certainly an argument to be made that this is the most successful series finale of any Trek show. Um, I mean, you can have your own personal preference. Uh, you can like what takes place or, or the story elements. But, you know, as we said before, it's just the perfect distillation of a TNG episode. It it centers around Picard. Uh, he's struggling with a scientific mystery like he does in many episodes. Uh, Data's being funny with cats. Uh, you've got time travel. You sprinkle in a little cue and boom. It's just like the sort of prototypical TNG episode, just more. And of course, there's the emotional underpinnings that come with it, you know, being the last episode of the show. So you're telling me the Turnabout Intruder is not your favorite finale? <laughs> Let's say intended finales. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Do, what do you think about, um, I guess, Yara as a character in general, but do you think that the show would have been uh, as good as it was if if Yara had stayed on? <sighs> you know... I mean, it's really hard to, to speculate. It's, 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 it's so hard long. because I think there were some actors. I, Patrick Stewart was pretty much terrific from the beginning. Other actors, I think, grew into their roles and sure. improved over time. I mean, Patrick Stewart got better, even, but he started at a really high level. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think, you know, there are actors on the show who improved. And um, I liked the character of Tasha. I didn't necessarily always appreciate Denise Crosby's performance, but that might not be Denise Crosby. It could be the scripts, which were not great in the beginning. Sure. Uh, could have been the direction, trying to figure out what the show was. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's really hard to know. Um, and uh, for, for one thing, what, what does that mean for Worf? Does he become a more prominent character or right. doesn't he? Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's really hard to know. I have to imagine that the show would have been good no matter what because it had the right people working on it. I mean, when they brought Michael Piller in, he really turned things around. Yeah. Um, Michael always wanted to write scripts and, and, oh, and, uh, and okay, green light scripts that were about something. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's Star Trek's middle name, right? So, you know, yeah, so, absolutely. That's why I'm doing uh, this. <laughs> yeah. And that and actually, that just reminded me, too, of Q's little, I, I will end here. You know, we're going to end your trek through the stars, which I thought, <laughs> yes. just, you know, it was just cute. That was just, I think that's the first time anybody says, like, the word trek on yep, a Star Trek show. I believe it was. And it was, uh, I thought it was just, it, it, it could have been hokey and corny, but from anybody else but for Q it was just sort of perfect yeah yeah and um and actually I thought uh did you think that when Data mentions acetylcholine it was just like they had they picked acetylcholine because Spock botched the acetylcholine test and the immunity syndrome oh yeah like a reference uh, I can yeah. see that sure I, you know I, I I when I when I heard that again I was like yeah that's got to be Ron Moore <laughs> yeah right yeah <laughs> Uh, speaking of uh, references and allusions, um, this episode p- uh, bears more than a passing resemblance to A Christmas Carol, I think, which is a well the franchise has gone to more than once, mm-hmm. at least a character traveling through time and seeing different time periods. Plus, you even got Picard in his jammies, you know, asking right. Worf at the end, what day is it? <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very Christmas Carol. I think it's really easy to make um, kind of dull time travel stories or mm. time travel stories that we've seen a hundred times before. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because time travel, while, while people who read and watch science fiction have been f- familiar with time travel forever, um, it's now sort of become mainstream as, as a device in, in TV shows and film yeah. um, in a way that it didn't used to be. I think movies like Back to the Future sort of made it kind of a mainstream concept. But you see it happen over and over again where it's like, yeah, I get this. There's the paradox. There's this, there's that, that happens. This can't happen, whatever. I've seen this a hundred times before. And I think this episode um, did a good job of finding a good way to portray time travel and make it interesting and maybe show it in a way that we hadn't quite seen it before with the three con- sort of converging. I-, I love the idea of anti-time and, and uh, mm-hmm. um, creating a, um, you know, the anomaly in the future and it, 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 then it grows backwards in time. Although, I mean, they tried to give some lip service over to why this would be, but it's, it, it was weird that they created something in the future and then got larger growing backward in time and it was you know so big in you know at the beginning of the enterprise's mission under picard and then it was bigger you know was bigger under the end of picard's mission uh captaincy well end of the series and then bigger still 
at the uh, at the beginning. Right. So it was getting bigger as it went backward in time. But if that was the case, you, after it was created in the future, after that, you shouldn't have been able to see it, right? Right, right. Because it was and, growing backward in time. But they, they gave should, up. There right. was a line later that they, that said, you know, oh, we, before it gets big enough to start going back in time or something like that. Yeah, right. They, they tried to, <laughs> they tried to, yeah, but it was like, eh, Not I'm to gonna, mention, I don't know what the properties of it are exactly, but the fact that once Picard is taken back to primordial Earth, it takes up like an entire quadrant of the galaxy. <laughs> like yeah. there's no way that earth would even develop to the point, And it doesn't, but right. uh, that you could even have like our galaxy, if there's this thing, that's a quarter the size of it. Right. Well, and I mean, earth did develop humanity didn't, but earth developed. So right. yeah, you would think, well, wait a minute, wouldn't that have changed too? But okay. <laughs> it's, it's all right. I'll give you that because it was an interesting enough uh, premise. And, and it, it was, it was good for so many reasons. I mean, it was just an interesting story. If this had just been an episode, just yeah. a, a, and not had the 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 overtones of of ending things, ending yeah. the series, if it had just been a, a, a mid season episode, it would have been very good because it was interesting. Um, but as as a as an ender for the show, it just really it brought it all all together. I mean, it really. Um, it uh, it highlighted the best sort of aspects of the show, uh, yeah. and and uh, it, it was a as you say probably the most six. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I, it was a great. It was maybe the most successful ending intended ending of a Star Trek series. But it, I don't know. I loved Deep Space Nine's finale too. But what's interesting about Deep Space Nine's finale is it's exactly the opposite of the origin of Next Generation, right? Mm. Where Next Generation says we're keeping on, keeping on. And right. maybe partly that's because they knew they were going to be doing films and stuff. But, um, you know, with Deep Space Nine, you know, every well, half the characters were, were, were leaving the station, leaving, you know, the, the environs of the show yeah. at its, in its final episodes. It was com- a completely different we're thing. tearing it all down, yeah. Um, but uh, it just there are so many things about the episode to enjoy. And, it, it you know, it had... It had the, you know, Q had the humorous bits to it, and there were deadly serious bits, and uh, yeah, <laughs> um, you know, it's just it was a it was a, it was a fine way to end the show. I, I, I think the first thing you want out of a, a series finale is for the episode to be good, irrespective of whether or not it it is a great finale. You just want it to be a great episode, right? Yeah. Because you can have a great episode, and it really didn't tie all the all the loose ends together, and it really didn't, you know, it doesn't coalesce the way you would want a finale to do. But you still want it to be a good episode. It started as being a good episode, and then it had all of these other things that really made it a great series finale. Yeah, good, good is a plus. Uh, we find out very little about the Q or the Q continuum uh, as the show goes on, but of course he's there to usher in and usher out the show. So he's certainly very significant. It leads me to ask, what what was Gene's, and I suppose other sci-fi writers of the mid-20th century, what was their obsession with like godlike aliens and being judged by them? Yeah, I don't know about that because there there are plenty of stories out there that – that have that. I mean, at some point, the notion that there was some omnipotent being out there, and, and also that it was an omnipotent being that was a child or a computer, at yeah, some right. point that was that was a new idea. And um, you know, Gene kept thinking it was new, even as he reused it. Right. But, <laughs> yeah. But but it's but if you 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 look at it um, again, it's it's always in the execution. Um, that's not all all in the execution, though, actually, because at some point you got to stop doing that, right? Um, yeah, well, I would guess it for me, it seems like it's a synthesis of the idea of like a, you know, a creator God or a father God, but trying to put it in a non-religious context. It's one of the things that really bugs me about Q, although I like uh, Delancey's performance. I mean, he is, for all intents and purposes, God. I mean, you can right. say that religion and superstition don't rule our lives when you're writing a sci-fi show, but you introduce a character that can literally smite you and you're, you're kind of <laughs> Back to square one. It's like yeah. you can take the god out of sci-fi, but you can't take it out of a sci-fi writer born in the twenties. Right, so I'm just right. wondering if it's like just the the men of that and women of that age writing these stories, trying to reconcile this idea of having to you know answer to someone or please someone or having a you know a god as a, as a north star for your morality. You know that's possible. I mean, there's certainly with any sort of dramatic fiction, 
even comedic fiction. That, you know, there are there are um, different waves. You know, people. You know, I. It, it, uh, you know, a few years ago, all we were seeing were vampire movies, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I mean, these, these things, you know, people, when when somebody wrote, you know, about man being judged by an omnipotent being that wasn't God, but was this advanced alien race or whatever, somebody else read that and thought, oh, you know, I got a great idea. I got a good spin on that. And then all of a sudden, you know, a lot of people are writing it. I, you know, I don't know. It, it may be um, because it's, uh, it's a weird thing because it's, it kind of is, sort of the worst aspect as far as I'm concerned of fantasy which is to say you are preloading your fiction with a deus ex machina right oh, sure. I mean yeah. and that can work I mean I think it worked in Q Who when the Enterprise and its crew were about to be decimated by the Borg and Q snapped his fingers and all was right with the world Right. Um, it, it worked there but most of the time that kind of thing doesn't work yeah. Um, and it's why I don't like fantasy is because you don't know what the rules are. Uh, so any time anybody's in jeopardy, any characters in jeopardy, I'm not really worried about it because I know, you know, somebody's come up with a spell. They're the to, chosen one. or right, Yeah. Right, I, you yeah. know, something's going to happen. That's, you know, it's not real jeopardy. Yeah. You know, the guy who, uh, you know, the saloon owner who beats his girlfriend, there's some jeopardy. Right. Uh, right. You know, but but because he's you know, he's, she's not going to be able to conjure a spell to stop him. So, uh, yeah, but that I mean, that's just my personal preference. But, yeah, there was a lot of that. There's a lot of the omnipotent beings um, and judging humanity and all of that. And I think you want uh, I mean, I think maybe the omnipotent part of that isn't as important as the judging part of it in mm. terms of dramatic fiction. OK, Um I don't know. I will tell you this, too. When you have a character who can do anything and knows everything, they're really fun to write. Well, maybe that's why they kept bringing him back. Yeah. Well, I, I have no doubt. Well, and, and I think John <laughs> Delancey's performance just... Well, yeah, absolutely. I that, mean, I yeah. think he, he probably imbued that character with more than they expected. Um, yeah, and, and certainly looking at how he is introduced originally in Farpoint as this very strange, you know, uh, eye makeup and the big hat and everything like that. Right. Uh, right. I don't know if that was just for the for the courtroom or uh, if they were going to go forward with that, but it was clear that it was just so much fun to have him just taunt Picard on the bridge in a captain's uniform. I, one of the aspects of Q that I've always loved is his penchant for costuming. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, I really man. love that he changes outfits all the time. Yeah, <laughs> and he can because, of course, he's you know, omnipotent. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, what I think that Q Who and also this episode work as stories a lot better than something like Farpoint, just going off of that being judged or having something to prove. Because, yes, it's deus ex machina, uh, if that's an expression, in Q Who, but the whole point is that our characters leave um, changed and uh belittled really by you know what they meet out there they realize that they don't have all the answers and they're not going to figure it out right now whereas in stories like a lot of first season stories are like this but in farpoint it's we're really great and then a godlike being says are you that great and then we figure it out and the godlike being's like i guess you're pretty great and it's yeah. sort of reaffirming this uh, yeah. sort of manifest destiny thing it's kind That's, of like the entire character of wesley is basically that right and it, it's sort of uh, yeah i mean it's it's wish fulfillment it's it's uh i have to say it's probably very american um, <laughs> okay. in that attitude you know i mean as far as i know i was thinking about this the other day uh, do other countries have superheroes in their fiction i mean that is the kind of thing that 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 realization that i don't think other countries certainly they don't have if they have superheroes they're not like i mean spider-man and 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 thor and and well thor might be a bad example since he's actually he's he's literally man. from but yeah. <laughs> but but you know iron man and spider-man and all these characters are worldwide phenomena yeah and um I just I don't know of any superheroes from other countries, so that you know, that is also sort of quintessentially American. And I think this this notion of being judged and saying, you know what, we are pretty great, is kind of an American notion as well. This <laughs> this sort of um, bastardized interpretation of American exceptionalism. I mean, American exceptionalism really refers to the fact that the development of the country was very different than anything that had ever happened in the development of a country in the history of the world. 
Right. But right. now there's a modern interpretation of American exceptionalism, just meaning because we're Americans, we're better than everybody else. Yeah, right. Which, you know, doesn't really track, but, you know, some people think that. So uh, I think maybe that's part of that that sort of judging and coming out on top. What I like about Q Who is not only do we not succeed, um, but you say the characters are changed and, and, and Picard realizes, you know, it is a big, wide, wild universe out there, and perhaps I and we have been a bit too complacent about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I really like that. Um, um, I think you're right that this episode and Q who work more successfully than than Farpoint. Um, yeah, if you're going to use a godlike character and there isn't any element of your characters being humbled in some way, then like, what's the point? There, it must be a Q episode. It is a Q episode where uh, Picard quotes Shakespeare and says, "What, what, what." <laughs> who is it who says, what a piece of work is man? Right, right. Uh, the th- <laughs> which is, you know, of course, beautiful and poetic, but is like the most proud, like, human thing. I'm going right. to quote this Shakespeare thing to you about how great we are. Right. But he, but in, in fact, I'm trying to remember, was it Hamlet or whoever says, what a piece of work of man? Picard even says what he says in, in ironically, I'm saying for real. Right, right. You know, um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It's, um but this this episode su- succeeded where where Farpoint you know Farpoint also to mitigate the issues that it had you're launching a new show and mm-hmm. you're launching a new show that already has a lot of baggage right right you know? yeah right right it, it, nobody thinks this can work I, I I was skeptical I think a lot of Star Trek fans were skeptical and uh, I think entertainment at large was skeptical and the, and the show was syndicated, right? It started off syndicated. Yeah. So that was a new model for things. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. It was, uh, and, and of course, uh, I mean, this may be blasphemous to say, but Gene Ronberry was perhaps not the best writer. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, possibly, <laughs> you know, um, and, and I mean, again, him having these same, tropes that he kept trotting out there and uh, and even did an encounter at Farpoint and so so you know the show needed time to breathe and grow and and find its legs and you know fortunately it did that it could have been canceled after a, you know two seasons and, oh yeah yeah and you know it, even as the show goes on i think it gets better about using q probably the most explicit use of q in a godlike role is in tapestry when picard dies and <laughs> q's there in the afterlife and picard's like no look i don't even believe in god and i know this can't be a thing come on now right right i, I love the fact that he actually says it I'm you're dead and I'm God. Right, yeah. <laughs> and of course you're not God and you know, I, I I but the fact is, what's the difference? And actually that's something that's missing from uh, omnipotent characters all the time. It's missing from Q, but it's also missing from forget about godlike characters, it's missing from God, which mm-hmm. is the notion of mechanism, right? Mm-hmm. Q snaps his fingers and you know, the gravitational constant changes, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. But how does that translate? I mean, we may not be able to understand it, but it's not mysticism, right? It's not sorcery. There, there's some science behind when he snaps his fingers, it causes what? Okay, he's not snapping his fingers. It's because he's thinking of something. But him thinking of something does what? How, right. what's, what's the, the mechanism, mechanism? Yeah. by which he envisions something and then it happens? Right. And there's no mechanism in the Bible or, or for any gods on earth. Right, the people, right. these beings, these gods, or whatever god it is, in whatever religion, they just are. They are all powerful. They are all knowing. And, and it even goes beyond the idiom of our show, which is how does tachyons or subspace or transporters really work? Well, we accept mm-hmm. that, but Q is even even beyond that. Right. Well, and it 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 verges on the mystical, right? Because yeah. Right. Yeah. There, at least with transporters. Yes, it may be something that can never exist, and it may be you know ridiculous. But at least we try and imbue it with some scientific basis, even if the basis, even if it doesn't follow, or even if we don't ever figure it out. At least the notion that hey, we're made up of matter, and we can we can read that matter and 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 take it and reform matter somewhere else in the, that exact image, and it'll be the exact... At least that makes some sort of sense, and there's a mechanism involved by which it happens, mm-hmm. right? But not, not for godlike beings, right? Right, right. And I, as a fan of 
some fantasy myself, I'd argue that uh, the fantasy I like the best uh, is is the ones that have its own set of rules, you know, internally consistent rules, much like the rules of our fictional fictional technology and Trek. Um, you know, having understanding that there is a price for things, and you can't just pull something down out of the air. Right, I, and I would agree with that because if you do have well defined rules, then you can have jeopardy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah. that. That makes sense for me. Um, you know, I, I think most people would not call Inception a fantasy movie, but a science fiction movie. <laughs> right. But, but to me, the problem with Inception, and I had a problem with Inception, even though I liked a lot of the actors in it and and, and the, the overall idea, is some, some part of the problem I have with it is that John, uh, Christopher Nolan created this complex set of, of rules for what he's, you know, for this universe that he's creating. But he, he he can't just spill them out initially, right? So because there are just too many of them and it's too complicated. So he's got to do it as the movie goes along. But the problem with that is when we get into Jeopardy, he then comes up with one of these rules and like, oh, okay, so it's right. not really Jeopardy. Right. So so it, for me that became unsatisfying. Right. Um, but yes, I think when you do have well designed sets of uh, rule defined sets of rules and you understand what the characters face and that there is you, then you can have real jeopardy and yeah i mean that that would be um my favorite part of uh, type of uh, fantasy as well sure. Something just still going on. We're not talking about tapestry. We've covered it on the show before, but we're mentioning it a lot. I think the tapestry is one of the first points in the series of TNG where we kind of get clued in on the idea that I think Q's on our side. He's he's in this thing with us. Like the continuum has it in for us for whatever reason, and they don't right. want us exploring the universe. But can, Q is convinced that we're worth saving, even if it's just so he can play with us, like uh, Mister Mixes Pitalik with Superman. You know, just right. and, uh, screw around with us. And so every time he plays with Picard after that, it's like he's grooming him to pass this eventual final test that comes out in all good things. Right. I don't know how pretending to be Robin Hood helps him pass the test, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, ta- yeah, Tapestry, I think you're right. It does show that, that in some sense, Q is on our side because Picard learned something very important about himself mm-hmm. in that episode. Um, and, you know, Q didn't have to do that, right? Yeah. And also the fact that the continuum apparently opposes uh, humanity and by extension the Federation like exploring space that's like the raison d'etre of the entire show like the fact that they they don't want a show at all don't right. don't yeah, go out yeah. don't pollute right. the universe don't discover new right. things right. they're like yeah. the ultimate bad guys yeah uh, and but again when you have bad guys that are completely omnipotent it's like how bad can they be if they don't just you know waste you if they don't just right. smite you <laughs> right. in the first minute they, you know okay uh, maybe they're not all bad, or at least, you know, at least maybe they're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that they are, um, and this is just discounting, I don't know, whatever they've come up with in the books, but do you think they are a race or a a, a being similar to humans that has just reached some evolutionary standpoint where they now sit kind of above the galaxy? You know, I, I think that perhaps that was Gene's, notion because i think gene roddenberry believed or wanted to believe that human beings would continue to evolve not just in a physical sense uh but in uh, in a in, in an intellectual sense and in a i don't know that they would evolve beyond even you know the need for human physical bodies. Uh, I think Gene sort of had that in his head, that we would continue to become better and better and better, more Mm. powerful, more knowledgeable. Um, So, yeah, I think maybe that's what he had in mind. But that that doesn't feel right to me. It sort of doesn't feel right from a dramatic standpoint, and it doesn't Mm. feel right from, if I can say this with a straight face, a scientific standpoint. And I I only mean the universe is only so old. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And it takes time. Evolution requires, you know, geologic time. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't feel like um, there would be that advanced a race in this, I'm going to say something ridiculous, short amount of time. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, you know, 13.7 billion years that the universe, it doesn't seem like that. But, you know, I, I, I don't know all about, you know, the entirety of space-time dimension. So perhaps. True. 
they are interesting characters, though. I wish, yeah. I kind of wish they had figured out how to show the rest of the continuum more. Yeah, they, yeah, we get little glimpses and sort of metaphorical uh, pictures of it, but yeah, I guess it would be hard for us to understand. Q yeah. it, it reminds me, it's just looking at it as uh, coming from a race of people with incredible power and he interferes with humanity all the time. It puts me in the mind of something like a slightly nefarious Doctor Who a character who uh, has an interest in humanity and he's always uh, he has a preference as well for humanity. I mean, we hear about him having visited other races, but face it, he, he seems pretty comfortable in a mariachi uniform. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's interesting, too, because, again, that seems sort of American to me, an American kind of attitude where you have an omnipotent being who develops an affinity for humanity. Oh, of course. <laughs> right. You know, I, I, mean, I think I think Americans believe that the world should be like America um, yeah. and that, that everybody should like Americans. So, um, yeah, uh, I think that that may be just a cultural element of, of all of these types of stories. Um, so you know, cancel the mariachi outfit then. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> What's, hey, who doesn't enjoy a good mariachi every now and again? That's true. That's true. Uh, we're told specifically in this episode uh, that the future is unlikely to unfold the way we actually see it unfold. And indeed, it does unfold very differently in the subsequent films. Uh, but one of the things that this episode accomplishes is that everybody's future seems very plausible from Data becoming a professor to a career minded Will getting the career and the ship that he wants. But he's really stressed and bitter about it. War joining uh, the Klingon Empire. And um, and and uh, and Troy dying. Yeah, that <laughs> actually the one thing that was seemed a little implausible to me, um, uh, yeah. from a character standpoint, was Beverly captaining a ship because I don't think I ever got the sense from her that that was something she saw in her future, which doesn't mean she didn't have it that that desire inside, and we never saw it. But sure. I, it just seemed like oh okay, it just was surprising. Um, I mean, Riker, even if he, even as he's saying, I don't want a ship of my own, you knew he wanted a ship of his own, <laughs> right? Right, I mean, yeah, that, that, yeah. He talked about it too much. He protested too much. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, they all seem like reasonable futures for, for I mean, Jordy, uh, uh what was Jordy doing? Oh, he's a, what was, he was what an was author. He had written, written oh, a right, book. Oh, right, an author, right, which, right. yeah, which was, um, that was kind of a surprise, but it didn't, didn't seem all that implausible to me. Um. Yeah, it's it's so sad that uh, just one more time uh, TNG gets to let down uh, female characters again by just saying, "Oh, Troy's dead." It's more yeah. it's more important that uh, Worf and Riker are feuding over this bro code violation that's twenty five years old than yeah. Uh, yeah. actually exploring what Troy would be up to. Although at the same time, we do bring Tasha back and don't have Riker at the beginning of the show. Yeah, that's true. Right. So then we, you know, but yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's an artifact of television in that age, I think. Um yeah. which seems to be changing. You know, it didn't really I mean it wasn't television, it was film, but it didn't used to be that way. Films used to have you know, women, prominent women stars. I mean, you know, name above the title, you know, the Greer Garsons and the and the Claudette Colberts and mm -hmm. um and uh, of course they now that I think about it, perhaps they were being paid half of what men were being paid, but at Possibly. least they showed up, and there were a lot of female writers back in the day as well, and it seems yeah. to be happening again now. So, Yeah, I think it's definitely changing, and especially in the Trek franchise, which is great. Um, well, we've talked kind of seriously and deeply about this episode and about the uh, series in general, so let's shift gears a little bit. Do you have a favorite episode of Next Generation? <sighs> yeah. Um, There's a lot to problem. choose from. Probably, um, uh, <laughs> you, you know, know all, good, all good things might be it. Okay. I mean, I really, really loved it for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I, I liked, I liked Tapestry a great deal too. And I know those are both Q episodes, but it's not because of Q. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's the fact that characters, and in this, in both of those cases, Picard, um, learned something, grew, you know, became you know he had a he 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 had he started from point a and went to point b and 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 those were distinct points and you know and of course he had more of a uh, a personal evolution in tapestry i think than he did in all good things but in both cases he took an emotional journey and for me 
when I when I read fiction or whether I watch television or films, the most important thing for me as an audience is for for that piece of entertainment to do something for me. It could make me laugh, it could make me cry, mm-hmm. it could make me think, what, whatever it is, I want it to impact me in some way. And the best way to impact people is for it to have some sort of emotional resonance. And I think watching somebody learn that, you know, I regretted this all my life, and it turns out maybe I, I, if I didn't do what I did, I wouldn't be who I am now. And right now I'm happy, so that must have been a, an important and necessary part of my life, even yeah. though I've previously had regrets about it, which is, you know, tapestry. And um, so, so you know, Inner Light, another Picard episode, uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, tremendously emotional. Um, there were a lot of good hours of Next Generation. Yeah, I mean, Q Who was a great, again, another Q episode, but Q Who was great. Um, and John Delancey was terrific in it, but the introduction of the Borg, again, what I loved about them was that they were a foe we did not defeat. I say we like we're the, you know, America's the Federation. Right. Yeah, America. Uh, Federation America. Yeah. Um, but the, our characters did not defeat the Borg. They were going to die. They were saved by an outside force. And that is not something we had really seen. Well, I guess we did see in, in Errand of Mercy in the original series. Um, You're more godlike aliens, too. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, but... I like episodes that are different, um, and, but also, you know, certainly episodes that engage me. And um, there were plenty of hours of um, Next Generation that did that. What, what is the episode with, um, oh, I haven't seen it in a long time, where the race does not have genders? The Outcast? The Outcast. I think that's a terrific episode. I think it would have been better if they had cast a man in the role. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but, you know, that was a terrific episode. Um, yeah, I mean, but all good things, if I had, if I had to choose one, I, I probably would pick all good things because, it, for one thing, it's longer so I could enjoy it more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just such a, a, um, a good coalescing of everything that came before. Yeah. You know, it really is, uh, I mean, when you're talking about a series finale and you're able to meaningfully include the very beginning of the show as a part of it, that, that really helps a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, and and uh, and you're also moving to the future of the characters, and like you said, they were all sort of plausible. Um, and it's always interesting to see where people go. But of course, you know, they couldn't. They could. They want to lock themselves into that. Yeah, that did change a little bit. But yeah, I, all of my moments, I think, or at least my favorite moments from the series, involve Patrick Stewart as Captain Picard. And even yeah. in even in this episode, you know, he's doing all the heavy lifting. Like the first act of the show is him just saying, I'm moving through time, and, right. and we believe him. And, right. you know, even the – I like how the, the crew, the, you know, our present crew in the episode – uh, even believes they're like okay well there's no evidence but a lot of weird stuff has happened on this ship so yeah let's check the ox- oxygen isotopes let's run some tests like it's just the authority that he commands like as that character is really fascinating to me i think it's not just authority actually i think it's also affection oh, um, yeah, sir. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I think even even as they think they i think they do think it's he's just dreaming or it's part of his illness or whatever. Right. I think even as that happens, they still want to, to give him the respect. Um, again, not just because they do respect him, but also because they love him. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, the, the, those aspects of it, um, that are a big deal. Right. Um, they, they love him and they respect him, but that won't stop them from taking his money at the poker table. <laughs> Well, I like like when he sits down and he says that little thing about, you know, I used to be uh, pretty good back in my day. I love that there's a cut to like Wolf yeah. and Data looking at each other like, okay, right. here's uh, the, pig- yeah. the pigeon is going to be plucked here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Picard is such a good character and it's largely yeah. because Patrick Stewart is such a good actor. Yes, yes. Um, well, Picard is a good character, but Kirk is your favorite captain. Uh, and also, I think Cisco is the captain you most enjoy writing for. Would either of them have succeeded in this dilemma in this episode? Well, Kirk, Kirk clearly would have just punched the spatial anomaly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can't you talk know, a spatial it, anomaly to death. It's really interesting because there's this notion that, that, that Kirk is the cowboy and Picard is the diplomat. And right. certainly, there's been a little bit of a change in the features with 
Picard becoming a little bit more of a cowboy, right? Yeah. But if you watch the original series, it's really interesting to me that Kirk, yeah, Kirk fires phasers and launches photon torpedoes and, and throws a punch. But Kirk also, before he does that, almost always he wants to talk. Right, right. You know, he really, he, he isn't ask, shoot first, ask questions later. It's ask questions, then shoot. Right, um, right. So he's not as much of a, 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 you know, a warmonger as, as some pop culture references would have you believe. I, I think Kirk may be my favorite character because he's, he was my first captain of sure, the Enterprise, yeah, yeah. you know? So I, there's, I like the exploration of the commander as a loner, uh, that the, the, the responsibility weighs heavily on him. Mm-hmm. Episodes like The Naked Time, where that was laid bare for Kirk, uh, just, I, I don't know, that, that resonated with me, and I, I just, uh, I, I don't know, I think that's why I sort of gravitate to him. But again, he was my first captain, so. Yeah. But I love Picard. I love Picard's I love Picard's diplomacy. I, I know some people complain about it, but it's it's the way to get things done, and yeah. it, it's the way it's the way to avoid having bad things happen. And there are plenty of episodes where where somebody says, you know, raise shields, and he says, not yet. Yeah, you right. Know, right. <laughs> let's talk. You know, I, yeah. I, I I I dig that. I I just I, I like it a lot. I, I I you know I might be inclined to love writing Picard if I if, if I'd written him more I haven't written him that much mm. um, but uh, Cisco I've written a lot and that may be one of the reasons that I've grown to enjoy writing for him so much yeah. um, but he's also got just this weird history this this personal history that is um, you know different from all the other Star Trek captains you know yeah. I mean Kirk and Picard are the loners. Cisco was married, lost his wife, raised a single father. Mm-hmm. Uh, and oh, by the way, you know, really prominent in the alien religion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then even in the books after, you know, at the end of the series, the television series, Cisco has ascended to the Celestial Temple, but he promises that he will be back. Well, in the books, eventually he comes back. Right. Um, and then he lives a life beyond that. So, and I've gotten to write a lot of that, and it's just been fun trying to carry the the, the character forward. Yeah. Um, I also, the, the, I think, um, I think Avery Brooks and Captain Cisco are important because they were the first minority lead of a Star Trek series, mm-hmm. and it was, it's like Star Trek sort of finally putting its money where its mouth is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, as always, you know, it's one of the things I loved. I love that they cast Kate Mulgrew, you know, and and uh, I love that they've cast, um, you know, a female lead in Discovery. So, um, I mean, this is this is always what I've loved about Star Trek the most is its spirit of inclusion, that everybody gets a, a seat at the table, every deserve everybody deserves to be treated equally, and. Um, you know, that may be something that really contributes to my appreciation for Cisco. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about the episode, the original series episode, The Conscience of the King, the other day, mm. uh, where, <laughs> you know, Kirk runs into Kodos, this guy, you know, who is this butcher that he's met before. And the the Kirk that everybody thinks they know would have just stuck that guy in a torpedo tube and just launched him into space. Right, but he spends right. the entire episode, you know, like trying to get him to confess or like researching. He ends up like literally waiting in the wings of a play <laughs> because right. he's not right. he's not that guy. Right. He's not that guy. And and he wants justice. He doesn't want vengeance. Right. Yeah. I mean, he, he feels like he wants vengeance, but he ultimately wants justice. And right. I think that is is an important defining characteristic of Kirk. Yeah. Um, you know, could Kirk have solved it? Of course. Could, could Cisco have solved it? He would have gotten the prophets to do it. So, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, all our heroes are always going to solve it. But sure. um, it. it, it I think they would have maybe solved it in a different way. Um, yeah. I think that you know, William Shatner would have relished the uh, chance to play three different Kirks. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, I brought up, just as a lark, <laughs> Turnabout Intruder, which was the final aired episode of the original series. Right. And um, um, William Shatner, I mean, it, it, there are so many things wrong with that episode, <laughs> not the least of which is, the, uh, her, the, the um, Janet Lester 
claiming that there are no female, essentially claiming there are no female captains in Kirk's world. Yeah. Now, you could argue she's nuts, and th- that couldn't have been the case, and maybe she was talking about Kirk's own sexism, but I, I, I would I would want to bristle at that. Um, um, and we've already seen that that, you know, in f- future shows, that that's not true. Right. So, but, but William Shatner portraying Janet Lester in Kirk's body, I think, I mean, you can laugh at it some, sometimes, some of the takes that he has, but actually, overall, he does a really good job of acting like he's not Kirk. Yeah, he goes for it. <laughs> you know, I think he's really, Kirk, William Shatner is a really interesting actor when he's not, when, he, when he's got a strong director. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. he can, you know, he's got Emmy Awards at this point, right, for, for Boston Legal. Sure. sure. Um, uh, I, I think, he, I mean, look at what you pulled out of him in The Wrath of, what Nick Meyer pulled out of him in The Wrath of Khan. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I think this is your third time on the show, which means you receive a promotion to full lieutenant. And I know that you've expressed a desire to climb the ranks of command, which, to be honest, is not something that we see much on the show. Somebody starting low and eventually achieving a position of leadership. You mentioned uh. Jordy's rise from lieutenant to chief of engineering. That's probably the best success story we see. But generally, we're introduced to a very young, good-looking character, and then we're told, oh, uh, so-and-so was the youngest officer candidate ever to whatever, whatever. Right, right. You never see somebody start, you know, in their 20s, and then it, it takes a while, but, you know, at the age of 50, they finally achieve, you know, captaincy of a small Oberth-class vessel somewhere. Well, in part, because we don't have 30-year-long television <laughs> shows, but right. but also, yeah, I mean, I see your point. We, I think more of that kind of thing is done in the books. Um, yeah. Who wants to watch a lowly ensign? <laughs> <laughs> the Adventures of the Lowly Ensign. We're getting that a little bit on Discovery now, and it's one of the things that disappointed me about um, the dropping of the premise or just the uh, the idea of it being an anthology show, you know, and seeing it at one time period and then maybe moving later down or, or going back more, mm-hmm. um, getting to see possibly characters at different points, you know, in their life and career. Right, right. We have to watch The Crown for that. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, there you go. <laughs> That's okay. All right. That's how I'm going to uh, get my get my fill of that. Well, Lieutenant George, thanks for talking to me about Star Trek and the Star Trek universe. If people want to continue the conversation, and they can at, at EISDPod on Twitter and the Enterprising Individuals Facebook page, where can people find you online? I have a website, D-R-G-I-I-I. That's David R. George III, D-R-G-I-I-I dot com. Uh, I'm also uh, on Facebook, uh, David R. George III. I'm on Twitter, David R. George III. I'm on Instagram, D-R-G-3. You can find me Everywhere. anywhere. And is, but you go to my website and you can find all of those links to all of my other social media presences. Sure. And any movie fans, I would definitely recommend going to David's site and checking out his movie reviews. He's got a lot of great analysis and uh, talks about a lot of cool movies. I appreciate that. I actually have a second uh, uh, website now. Oh. Uh, even though I still post my movie reviews on my drgiii.com website, mm-hmm. I actually have a new website where uh, I'm just – putting all the movie reviews because sometimes I'll just do full blown reviews and sometimes I'll just do what I call compact reviews, which are just yeah. a couple of paragraphs about, about a movie or whatever. And, sure. and, and here and there, I'll even just say a sentence or two and I call those uh, just quick takes or whatever, but it's movie reviews by George.com. Okay, great. But you can also find links to that on my brd 3 com website as well. Okay. Well, thanks again for joining me. Thank you, Aaron. It's always great to be here. Great to talk to you. You too. We're signing off until the next mission. Hailing frequencies closed. Oh, no, no.